So this presentation is basically how can I find help? What can I do as a land manager? What are the resources available to me? We're talking technical resources and financial resources. I'll repeat that financial resources. Okay. Very important to help. So for this panel discussion, we've got five people here and um, I'll just kind of recognize them. Um, first off, we have RT Lumpkin with the Georgia Forestry Commission. And, and oh, by the way, I'll let each of you come up and kind of introduce yourselves a little bit more fully and then talk a little bit about, about your program. And then um, we also have a couple of landowners with us, you guys, um, to talk about your um, kind of successes, challenges, whatever you want to talk about. And then you all are part of the panel, too. We've got ample time. We want a lot of questions directed up here. And uh, we want to get you the, the help that you need. Okay, so R.T. Lumpkin with the Georgia Forestry Commission. Uh, Noah McCord with NRCS. That's up under the U.S. Department of Ag. And um, Diana McGrath is with the DNR Private Lands Program. And I'm sorry, guys, I miscounted my notes. And so we've got Mr. Hal Avery and Mike Mr. Mike Harris. Uh, sorry, but they'll introduce themselves again. Sorry to be a little disorganized here. So again, the the um, the order of this is going to be each speaker is going to come up and talk for a few minutes and tell you what they have to say. And then we will start taking questions from you. And um, Eric and I will be running around, you know, handing the microphone out. and. Oh, because the um, the audio is so much better from this mic, I'm going to ask each speaker like, if there's a question, direct it to whoever or or one of you just you know come up and answer it from up here. And then also speakers, if you don't mind, when a question is asked, if you could, even though they have mics, sometimes it doesn't come through very well, especially for the recording that we're doing of this meeting. So please just just kind of repeat, at least paraphrase the question back before you answer it. Okay, good. All right, thank you. So we'll start off with, with RT. Good evening or morning. Where are we at now? <laughs> Afternoon-ish? Yeah. yeah. Right before lunch, always a good time. It be right in between lunch and uh, these topics. But my name is RT Lumpkin, as Scott said. I work in West Central Georgia. I cover about 13 counties. Uh, primarily working with private landowners to eliminate barriers to prescribed fire. Uh, we we do that through a multi-phase approach of listening to landowners and working with our partners to try to find solutions that, that meet mutual objectives. We found pretty good success operating uh, a couple of burn trailers in West Central Georgia. Uh, you've heard mention of the Sentinel Landscape Pilot Project that actually funded a, a second burn trailer in this area, along with some cost share programs uh, that actually incentivize private landowners to burn. Additionally, we host two different versions of training events for private landowners. One we call lift or landowner field trips. Uh, our, we work with our partners to get some equipment to equip a UTV so that we can take a landowner to a piece of property that looks like what I know the property is going to be. So we take that and if you tell me you want to see what long leaf looks like after it's been burned, we can jump on that UTV, go look at maybe Mr. Howell's property that's right close by yours and you can see what it looks like. I can envision that, but trying to explain it and tell landowners that it's been a very valuable tool. And the other are learning birds and just letting you hold a drip torch. And, and letting you burn a piece of property. So if you're interested in those things, I'd be happy to take some questions in a minute. No? Okay, I'm Noah McCord. I'm the NRCS state biologist and currently the acting state forester for Georgia. And so NRCS has a number of programs to provide technical assistance and financial assistance for farmers and forest owners. Uh, we have offices all over the state, and there's multiple things that you could uh, apply for assistance with. So uh, we 
look at the resources, the or I'm sorry, the natural resources that are out there, and if there's some sort of degradation or issue or what we refer to as a resource concern, then we can develop a plan to address those resources. And you could potentially get some financial assistance to assist with implementing some of these things. That so for for forestry, a lot of our common practices would be um, uh, planting trees, uh, site prep, uh, addressing any sort of invasive species, uh, planting just uh, herbaceous vegetation, and of course the big one would be uh, prescribed burning. Uh, like I mentioned, we've got offices all over the state. Uh, it's fair, fairly easy to get in touch with us, uh, even if you're not completely sure what exactly you may be able to do. You can chat with us and we can develop a plan and kind of go go from there and see what you would like to see happen with, with your property. Okay. Oh, all right, short girl needs to bring down the mic. Hi everyone, my name is Diana McGrath and I am with the uh, Georgia Department of Natural Resources Private Lands Program. Um, I just wanna also recognize that, so the Private Lands Program in Georgia is a partnership with Quail Forever. Um, so they're also here today and everything I'm gonna talk about um, that we provide as far as services go, um, it's, it's a joint effort between DNR and Quail Forever to provide those services. Um, so many of you are probably aware Georgia is 93% privately owned. Um, so wildlife is a resource that we all share. And so it's our job um, as a state to promote those resources in um, the best way possible for conservation. And so that's what we do or what we're tasked with trying to do. So um, we provide technical assistance and financial assistance to private landowners all across the state. No matter where you are, there's a biologist who serves that area. Um, and you're probably gonna hear those two terms a lot during today's talk, technical assistance and financial assistance. And to break that down into a little bit more plain English, technical assistance is anything that falls into the category of advice. So it's providing recommendations for how to address those resource concerns on your property. It might be um, connecting you to resources or teaching you training skills. Um, so one of the things that we do in, in DNR is often put together learn and burns where landowners can come out um, and experience fire in a very safe manner um, with, with professionals who, who do it for a living. Um, so, you know, and then financial assistance, the way that DNR helps and Quail Forever helps with that is that we're actually affiliate biologists with NRCS. And so what that means is that we try to take their programs um, and put them on the ground in the best way to address the wildlife resource concerns on the property. So whether that be that you're managing for a focal species such as gopher tortoise or quail, um, you know, we can provide plans for those. We can also provide general wildlife plans for deer and turkey. I mean, habitat management is um, pretty good across the board. So um, that's just a little bit about the services we provide. Um, hopefully you all will have some really good questions for us and, and we'll get into some more topics here in a bit. So, um, Hal. Uh, my name is Hal Avery. Uh, we have a farm uh, about a thousand so acres up in the north part of Harris County. Uh, about the year 2005, we quit the cattle business and started a project of uh, rewilding, planting long leaves. Uh, We've got about, about 100 and something acres of CRP, CP36 long leaves. Uh, we've got about another 100 acres of long leaves that are not in CRP. We have some substantial acreage that are that's in uh, hardwood uplands. And the open lands that we had in cattle pastures, we've been converting them to our early successional habitat and striving to maintain that. Um, we've, we've used fire pretty successfully in several areas that I'll address if anybody wants to direct those questions. The uh, prime uh, idea of our farm right now is uh, pretty much the conservation and uh, outdoor recreation. Uh, not commercially, but, uh, and I'm not doing it for virtue signaling, or I'm not doing it to save the planet. It's just because what I want to do, and we really enjoy it. So, 
mic. Yep. I'm Mike Harrison, and I'm a private landowner in Sly in Marion County. And I've been practicing prescribed fire for 20 or so years, and I'm a big proponent of it. It has a lot of benefits that I'm sure we'll be talking about later through answering questions or questions among our panel up here. But it's you heard earlier in the wildlife presentation, it's key to what we're trying to do. Like Mr. Avery, I have a, a maybe a broader management plan because I am into it also for the commercial aspects of it in terms of the timber income to hopefully have our family hold on to this land in the long run. You hate to maybe sit this land for all your life and then they sell it and buy a beach condo. So my objective is to keep it in the family. So we've got that, but but mainly on recreation, aesthetics, the commercial side of it, and that's who we are. Okay, thank you all. Now, and this is the part where we're gonna kick it to you guys. This whole presentation is designed to be super interactive. So if you have a question for the landowners, um, uh, Mr. Mike, Mr. Howe, or any of our three panelists with financial resources this time. So let's, let's talk hands. Does anybody have any questions? You guys got shy on that one, let's say. So, uh, no, no, here's the one. And, and I'm going to bring this to you. Let me, let me say this too, as, as a related personal experience, real quick. I've been coming to these meetings for a long time. I've been involved with fire council since its inception. And as a, as a middle Georgia landowner, I never took advantage of these things until this year. I, I kept hearing these presentations and hearing these presentations. And I, I finally took them up on it. And one of Diana's um, counterparts came out to our property, did it, you know, gave us some notes and I help. And I want to make sure that, that you all get that help. So. Start with my first question. Hi, my question is for the Chicago Adams. I was wondering for 2005 or 20 years ago, how you got tied in with burning properties. So you back in here. Okay. Um, so he asked uh, in prior to 2005, how did you get started burning um, on your private property? Like what? How did you get your start? Okay. Um, we didn't burn any until 2005. Uh, we started burning then. Uh, we we did a real thinning on some old live lollies, and uh, that's when I first started burning to use that to use the fire to uh, maintain an open stand of live lolly pines uh, in a kind of a wildlife plantation setting, uh, attending. A, Attended a couple of meetings of the the Long Leaf Alliance and plus reading. That's the way I was going. It started initially on a small scale, uh, mainly for looking at aesthetics and and if you think as you're riding down the highways in our state and you look and you can see a place that's had prescribed fire and you can see a place right next to it that's grown up so thick you can't see. 10 yards into it. And so through a combination of, of mid-story release and prescribed fire, I've managed to keep most of our pine stands open to a state where we can we can enjoy that and put more of the nutritional value of that soil into the trees rather than the understory that's of no value, the sweet gums, although the perky guy said, I need to keep my sweet gums for nesting. So Paul, if you put that in our prescription, but you can you can effectively mix the two, the the chemical application as well as fire if you do it at the right timing and and once you get it under control then you can keep it that way if you keep fire in it if you don't then you end up with a jungle again so it's something you have to maintain once you start it to get the good out of it you need to continue hey there uh Larry Randa, or uh one question for the agency folks uh so many programs out there, and directly said earlier, where do you start? So you're right, there are a lot of resources out there currently and more coming. One of the first things that I see with new landowners trying to get started is they find out about a program and they just want to apply, but they don't. 
they don't really know what that objective is that the program's trying to accomplish. So one of the best ways to actually get started is to have a forest stewardship plan or some type of management plan that multiple agencies provide or either collaborate on to work together. So once you get that plan together and you know you need to be burning next year, then you can reach out to these different agencies that have programs to target cost share dollars to uh, assist you with your objective instead of just trying to pull a balloon down from the sky and hoping it's the right color you want. It, you can target that with that plan. There's several people in this room that uh, write plans on a daily basis. I believe both the landowners have stewardship plans. Maybe if, if they want to, they can mention if they've been beneficial to them or not. So I'll kind of add to that, um, like RT said, determining your land objective is probably from from the landowner side of things, definitely the best place to start. Um, and, and it's OK to have multiple objectives, but at the end of the day, something needs to be a primary objective. So having that objective defined before you start coming to the us agency folks helps us not box you, but kind of direct you to the best resource. And so if you're a multiple objective landowner, you know, you have agriculture, you have pasture, you have timber. Um, Noah is probably going to be the best fit for that because his federal programs can encompass all of those things. If uh, if you're really, really gung ho about wildlife, um, you know, we have we have programs for that, whether it's endangered species you're trying to promote on your property or if it's game species, um, you know, we on the private lands program are, are going to be focused mainly on what we call like early successional animals, so such as quail and gopher tortoise, um, but we also have. You know, DNR also has a DMAP program, our deer biologist. I know Emily's here, so um, we have one of those represented today. So it really does kind of help to have that, those objectives defined. Um, but, you know, starting somewhere is better than nowhere, and we are all a team. Um, so, you know, if you end up getting me out to your property and I'm the first one to get a hold of you, um, you know, it, it's kind of helpful to know that and to know that, okay, we're starting from scratch. Um, Another thing to kind of think about as far as where to start is um, a lot of landowners, from my experience, they get really kind of tied down to, I want to apply to the pro program. I want to apply to the program. Well, most of these programs are going to require you to do work. And so knowing what needs to be done on the property also helps us identify the best fit for you. Um, the other thing to kind of keep in mind when you're getting started is patience. I know that, um, you know, our management in Georgia moves very fast. You know, we're telling you to burn on a one, you know, one to two year rotation. It, it moves very fast. We're the government. We move really slow. Um, and so, you know, having having a plan, um, you know, to, and to know that it's going to take it's going to take a year or so to get you that plan. Um, and then the other thing is to remember to ask questions. Uh, we uh, get really tied into acronyms and programs and we'll forget sometimes what we're saying and, and we just need to kind of be reminded um, to, to come out of that box. So I hope that helps address your question, but start anywhere, um, you know, rather than start nowhere. Don't be too intimidated. We'll, we will try to help you the best we can um, interpret some of this stuff, whether it's working with the feds or working with a state agency or a non-for-profit, so. And I'll just add, add to that, that, that from an NRCS perspective, what a good place to start would be to contact a local office. Go, go, go in there, set up a time to meet with them, discuss what you may want to do with them. And if you do have an objective of wildlife, but uh, maybe we can uh, forward some of your information onto to one of the biologists to get together with you to develop a plan. Uh, we also have a good partnership with Georgia Forestry Commission. If, you're, if you have a forestry objective, we've, there are a lot of foresters that can come out and meet with you and, and develop a plan. Uh, another thing to consider is that we are the government and there's a lot of paperwork that's going to be involved. So getting those records established, uh, Farm Service Agency is our kind of our sister agency that handles a lot of the records. So getting together with them, making sure you've got uh, information submitted to them uh, and with NRCS to so get, get everything in ahead of time so that when these programs are set to start roll, rolling through, you'll be, you'll be set and you can go ahead and apply. 
Uh, I just another note that we do have, if somebody is local here, our local DC is here. Um, Kenner, if, um, yeah, so if anybody is local and like to even chat with one of our local district conservationists, um, he'll, he'll be here today as well. Yeah, I'm Kendrick Calder. I'm the local um, NRCS guy that's refined. We cover Chattanooga, Harris, Marion, Muskogee, Auburn. We main the main office is in Marion County, New Vista, but we also have an office in Hamilton, Harris. So, like they said, the best thing to do is make a phone call, come see us. Send me an email. There's any way to contact us to get that process started, and we're always available to try to help our again. The other thing I would add to that is there's a lot of cross information available. Any of these people that manage these programs knows the, what the other agencies are doing, and this is an important meeting too. I've been to. 10 or 12 of these since they started. And my objective when I go to a meeting like this, I was at the Georgia Forestry Association annual meeting. We go to the Forest Landowners Association meeting or members of all those organizations, Tree Farm. And you'll find a lot of information available on their websites or in their periodicals. But my objective is always to take something home with me from something like this. I'm taking something home on this one, finding out more information on the online permitting system for burn permits. And I'm was impressed with how easily that seems to be working now. And and I think if you'll find any of these experts, whether it's NRCS or the Georgia Forestry Commission or any of those, they generally know a little bit about what's going on at the other agencies. And it makes it a little bit, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. It, there are people out there willing to help you and a lot of good resources available to us here in, in Georgia. I can't speak across the river, but here we're in good shape. I got a question here. Uh, I think the best place to start, in my experience, is just uh, check with Mr. Google. So that's the easiest, quickest, best way to get information that I know of right now. So, anyway. I got a good question. Is there any financial assistance to describe during wildlife? Yeah. Uh, yes, so yes, there is financial assistance for prescribed burning Bob Lolly stands. So the, the way NRCS works with a lot of our programs, some of them may be specific to like, long leaf, uh, but there are a number of other programs that are just more general forestry or wildlife. And there, there's nothing in, in the guidelines for our prescribed burning um, practice specifically saying you can only burn this type of stand. It's it's broad for anything, whether you're doing hardwoods, uh, pines, uh, or even just open grasslands. There's nothing specific saying you can only burn these types of stands. So um, I will mention from from a wildlife perspective, as far as lava lolly stands go, a lot of the management that we we do for wildlife is in the understory of lava lolly slash. I mean, you know, we have a saying that, I mean, quail don't care about a tree. Um, so, but the where, where it comes down to, again, balancing those objectives from um, a timber industry standpoint is the timing. And so to balance the forestry and, and the wildlife there, you're probably not going to receive financial assistance to burn until after it's been thinned once, or maybe even twice, depending on the basal area of the trees. And that's just kind of the reality of the balance of the two objectives. Um, it's one of the reasons that as a wildlife biologist, if we're doing a consultation prior to you planting those trees, trees on the ground, we're probably going to try to push you towards longleaf. Um, and, and that is because of the ability to keep burning that stand when it's young. Um, and also the fact that, um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily shape in as, as quick as lob volumes last. So, so absolutely, yes, from a wildlife perspective, you can get um, financial assistance to burn in lob lolly, not until it's probably been thinned. So do you mind me asking what county? you're referring to? Well, we actually over in Alabama. Okay, well, for landowners that are in the 13 counties around here, the Forestry Commission in conjunction with many partners runs the West Central Georgia Prescribed Fire Initiative. And it does not target any particular species or as a, a cutoff. 
uh, anybody that is a landowner and is forested land and not site prep qualifies to apply for the program. So it, it, it depends on the funding level that we have and the ranking criteria from the funders as to what gets funded in it. But the only thing you have to be qualified in is to be the legal landowner, be willing to burn it, and uh, but that's it. We, the, the funding side of it determines how many applications we can fund. So. The, the program Ortiz talking about, he does a good job of going after these grants and the money's good. It's nice to have the money and it's and it's substantial and it covers the cost of burning. In my case, I do a lot of the work myself, maybe the fire breaks and certainly assisting with the burns. But the other thing that these landowner groups like the one RT heads up is they bring the technical expertise to it as well. He mentioned the burn trailers and and you think, well, why do I need a burn trailer? Well, what do you see his little blower that he pulls behind it side by side and keeps you from making a fire break down a hill that you don't really want to put it. So the technical uh, availability, the equipment availability, the manpower on the ground, uh, all that contributes into this thing. So beyond the cost side of it, you've got a lot of other benefits that are available to you from these agencies. Question for Diane. So if I'm understanding the question, it's um, about pooling together some of the resources um, and making making that available in one in one spot. And and that does that does become kind of tricky, um, you know, with a lot of these programs and, and availability, the um, the eligibility might change over time. Um, you know, the application periods might change over time. The funding sources change over time. And so across agencies that gets pretty difficult um, because each agency is going to be managing at a at a different level um so so no i don't have a central place um where landowners could go to kind of get information across agencies um no fun. Yeah, um, one one really good way to be informed, at least with our program. Um, so every biologist does um, put together a landowner listserv. Um, and this is how I like to communicate with my landowners, especially across central Georgia. I've, I recently moved across the state and took a promotion, but I'm still sending out um, notices to those landowners when uh, programs do come available. Um, it's it's not, you know, it's, it, it's not super clean, um, but we do get the information kind of from the government side of things first. And so if I hear about a good uh, pop-up program that the Longleaf Alliance is putting on, I send it out to the list serve. If, um, you know, they, they have a learn and burn coming up um, at Heather's place down in Berrien County, plug for that, um, October 27th. So that went out on my list serve. So it's, it's not a perfect way to do it, but um, we, we do kind of put things out like that. We also have a uh, a quarterly newsletter that goes out that um, in that newsletter will also have a summary of every all the information we have at that given time. Um, so hope that answers your question. So one of the things we found out was that very question comes up a lot. Landowners just don't know where to start or um, where these resources are. So we we have a, a group that we organize and try to send out information uh, about pertinent events. This is one example of it. I'm not sure how many people got a, an email from me or a, saw a social media post, but we maintain that and we try to send out information on specific programs for West Central Georgia in particular. I, my hope is that when you see an email from me, it's, oh good, there's something pertinent to my forest land in this area, and, and you'll want to open it and read it. If you're interested in joining that, come see me. It, it doesn't cost a thing. It's free. We have some great minds here that help advise that group on what meetings we have. We have another Mr. Miller's down here. He's another gentleman that helps us. Uh, it doesn't cost a thing. It's just a way to stay informed about those programs you mentioned. Yeah. 
Good morning, I'm Michael Hudson, the director of the Bay Area Street Program, and specifically, uh, mobile owner property. Is there a program in the state, local, nonprofit, or profit that can assist the multiple owner property when some of them are fine agreement? That's the answer I did. Yeah. Uh, I have a second question. Unbated. That, that is a tough one, um, and, and we do, um, we see it, uh, we, we do see it um, across the board, especially with, um, you know, in, inheriting properties um, over time, you know, that they split it between two kids and then, you know, the next generation splits it between four and six. Um, so anybody with landowner, you know, status on a property is eligible for these programs. Um, we can work with groups and, and present different objectives, but at the end of the day, we are non-biased. All of our programs are voluntary enrollment. Um, that is one big thing that, you know, we make very clear, um, especially, you know, from the wildlife side of things. A lot of times, you know, wildlife comes as a secondary or a tertiary objective because it's, it's not your moneymaker. Um, and so we can just present the information in a non-biased way to everybody um, and, and kind of let the family decide from there. But technically speaking, anyone on, you know, who is a landowner is eligible to apply. Um, so, and, and receive assistance, um, both technical and financial. One of our landowners referenced concern for what the kids would do after we finish our lifetime. Have either landowner, has either landowner considered enrolling in a conservation easement? And we have not required. I looked into the conservation easement idea maybe eight or 10 years ago and elected not to do that. Um, where conservation easement can keep your land from future development, it can't keep it from future sale. So it may fix the value of your property at a certain value and your heirs can still sell it to somebody else who keeps it so it doesn't keep it in the family. So we elected to stick with the private side of it and not get into that. And the thing to remember, two, two things I would stress to you if you're looking at conservation easements is read that easement in detail and don't miss anything. Uh, it's easy enough to get the language in there to allow you to continue agricultural and forestry practices and thinning and whatever. But if it doesn't have that written in it, you can forget it. It's not going to happen. And the other thing I would say is perpetual is a long time. And that's what all of them are, perpetual easements. Excuse me. I would think that a conservation easement is a, a real good idea for people that are that understand it fully and are committed to the idea of it and are, are willing to do it. I think it's good. That's certainly what I have. Uh, regards uh, citizens of private landowners, and I hear a lot about. Uh, PDAs, the tribe owner associations. Can you guys speak to that and the benefits are of that and how people can maybe reach out to those their local PDAs? So I'm going to go back to your first question right quick. Um, it really wouldn't, the landowner field trips that I mentioned earlier can potentially help with that if it's just a lack of understanding of what you want to do. Because sometimes it's that lack of knowledge is what's preventing prescribed burning. And if you can carry somebody to a property that shows the benefits of thinning and they see deer and turkey running around a property and they enjoy that too, it can be helpful. Um, on prescribed burn associations, we mentioned the burn trailer. We run one here in this particular area. Where, where's Mr. George Jetson at? Hey. There he is. He, he's got another one. I, where's... Um, I know I'm missing a few others, but they're very easy to stand up and you can actually get with any of these partners. There's 
multiple resources out there to stand one up in your particular area. And it's, it's nothing more than a couple of landowners that get together and share resources. And there's actually funding out there to support extra drip torches and tractors and putting those those people together to work in a particular region. It really needs a, a leader to kind of run it. And uh, I feel like for West Central Georgia, I may be one of those people. And George is another one. And I, where's Susan French at? She's hiding way back there in the corner. I, I know I'm missing a few others, but... They're scattered around the room and they probably have a table set up over here. So make sure you check them out. Okay, thank you all. That is all the time we have for questions. So